In this video, I'm going to walk you through a market sizing case interview example so that you understand what a market sizing case is, what's expected from you, and a little bit of how to solve it. And I'm also going to pause the video at some points to help you read between the sidelines and understand why this case and this dynamics is playing out the way that it is. I'm Julio from Crafting Cases, ex Bain consultant. And you're going to see me interviewing Bruno, an ex-McKinsey consultant and also the other Crafting Cases guy. So by the way, I'm making this video right now because we have a free course on case interview fundamentals available to you. But also, module one of that course is 100% focused on estimations and market sizes. And there, you're going to learn a step-by-step -step approach to solve any market sizing question and also some practice so that you can put that to work and see whether it works or not, what your weaknesses are, what your difficulties are, so that you can practice and eliminate them and become, well, a master in market sizing. Let's get right to the interview. What I want from you today is, can you estimate the market size for brake pads in the United States? Uh, brake pads, mm -hmm. so in dollar value. Yeah. Market size or brake pads. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. uh, a brake pad is the replaceable thing on the brake, on the braking system of a car. Yeah. So it's that pad that deteriorates as you use it. Mm -hmm. A pair of pads off. that presses on the, on the whatever in the car. Okay, cool. Uh, and should we, another clarification question, should we estimate this just for cars? Or, because I guess you use them in semi-trucks and maybe trains, airplanes, race cars. Yeah, and probably in industrial settings as well. Yeah. Uh, but let's do only cars. Okay. And let's actually do only personal use as well this okay. time. Okay, so, so excluding commercial cars. Yeah, so no delivery cars, no rental cars. Okay. Sounds sounds good. Mm -hmm. Th thank you for that <laughs> simplification. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, so if I may take a moment to structure my 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 thoughts here and see how I approach this. Go on, take your time. Okay, so Th this is a yearly market, right? Yeah. Okay. Market in one year. Okay. All right. So first thing that I want you to see here, notice how Bruno is asking me about the scope of the question that I asked. Uh, are, brake, are these brake pads that you want to know only for cars, transport trucks, airplanes, all kind of brake pads? So he wants to know all that kind of stuff. Now, it happens, it does happen that the scope isn't clear in a market sizing interview. And the interviewer might want you to clarify. So they might want to see if you're the kind of person who will ask about something that they don't understand rather than just go and try to solve the case from their minds without confirming. And they really want... Uh, candidates who can confirm and really understand the scope of what they're doing before they start doing it. Now, it might, of course, be the case that you just didn't understand the scope. And if that's the case, you still want to ask because you really, really, really don't want to start solving that case without really understanding the question that the interviewer is asking. Okay, so I think I have a structure that we can use to estimate this case. One quick note here. In these cases, it's normal and expected to take some time to think before you answer. So that's what Bruno is doing right here. Another common approach is to think as you speak. But that's something that I'd really only recommend to you if you're very, very advanced. Okay. So the way I would do this is I would, to find the dollar value of brake pads sold retail per, uh, for you know, personal use cars per year in the US mm -hmm. would be to estimate first the number of brake pads sold per year in the US yeah. for that class of vehicles and then multiply that by the dollar value or the retail value on average per brake pad. Okay, okay. makes sense. Uh, to estimate the number of brake pads sold per year, mm -hmm. I'd find first the number of active cars in the US. Yeah. Uh, so I guess for personal use, that would almost all cars that people have would be uh, active in some way. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's like collectibles or something that are not, but I'd guess 100% are active. 
Okay. Okay. But I'd find the number of total cars in the US, in, in US households uh, that are active, and then multiply that by the number of brake pads per car per year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would give us the number of brake pads per year. Okay. To find number of cars in the US, I do number of households, which is population divided by people per household, number mm -hmm. of persons per household, and then multiply that by the number of cars or active cars per household. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to estimate the number of brake pads per car per year, uh, the first variable I need to find is how many times on average uh, do people replace their brake pads per year? Okay. So this could be more than once per year or less than once per year. Could yeah. be a number bigger than one or uh, smaller than one. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd multiply that by the number of uh, of uh, brake pads replaced every time people replace their brake pads. So I All right. You mentioned there's two per wheel, so I'd assume it's eight brake pads uh, mm -hmm. per car, but I'm not sure if they'd uh, replace all of them at once, which kind of makes sense on average, right? Yeah. Because you break all wheels at once, but yeah. anyway. Uh, so that's my structure. Does, does this sound like a good start? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. You can go with that. Okay. So, uh, all right. Another pause. Take a look at this. One thing that I want you to notice is that Bruno started building only a structure, only the mathematical path that he's going to take to solve the case without actually placing any numbers, without actually doing any calculations. He's only discussing the approach mathematically. And that's because he wants to make sure that I, the interviewer, understand what he's going to do before he starts to work on it. So that if I disagree with his path, I can talk about the path without disagreeing with the entire answer or without waiting until he's done. And without, of course, him wasting a lot of work on something that's eventually going to have to be done again so i think i need to do some assumptions mm -hmm. but uh, yeah there's a couple numbers that i want to ask if you have because they're more industry specific and mm -hmm. i'm not sure i can uh, have a great assumption for those so the first one is how often do people replace brake pads so you need to replace your brake pads every 30 to seventy thousand miles driven 30 to 70,000 miles. Yeah. Okay. And do you replace all of them at once? Yes. Okay, so it's eight brake pads per car. Yeah. Or is it four? Like, does, does it come in a pair? No, each wheel will require two. Okay, so eight pads replaced. On the same note as before, notice how Bruno wants to see if I'm okay with the path that he will use to solve the case. So that if I disagree with something, he can change it now before doing more and more work. And then, uh, the do you have an average value per brake pad? Because yeah, I haven't switched my, I haven't changed mine in years. Yeah. Should it's probably eighty dollars per axle. Per axle. Yeah. Okay. So for every two wheels. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So let me switch this variable for to number of axles. Okay. Replace just to make the math better. We have two axles per mm -hmm. car and then $80 per axle. Yeah. And that's an average of the market. Yeah. So it's not just the low end, it includes all cars. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, all right, time to pause again. One thing that you need to know about estimations and market sizings is there are some numbers that are just really hard to get to. And the interviewer will sometimes have to give them to you. And sometimes they're going to require you to come up with those numbers. In this case, I'm giving Bruno a few numbers, but I could have asked him to come up with his, the numbers himself from his mind. He would have to model it somehow. He'd have to uh, come up with numbers from his life and then triangulate to these numbers. Now, you can find some techniques on how to do all of that in our free course, which is... Uh, you can find in craftingcases.com slash free course. And you will see Bruno doing that for some of the assumptions here as well. But right now, what I want you to see is that sometimes you can ask for numbers. You can always ask for numbers. Sometimes the interviewers will give it to you. And if they don't, no big deal. Use the techniques that you'll learn in the free course. Place the numbers yourself. Interviewer is going to love it. Uh, for population 
if I'm not mistaken, there's about 300 million people in the US. Yeah, close to that. Okay, so let's do 300 million. And I would assume there's three people per household on average. So lots of uh, single person households, also lots of households with a couple and three kids. Mm -hmm. I'd say is, is three a good average for nowadays? Yeah, three sounds okay. Okay, maybe it's four because, yeah. It's a little bit less than three, but you can go with three. It's less than three. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll go with three then. Uh, and then active cars per household. This one, well, every American that I know has a car. I've lived there and everyone pretty much needs a car in most cities at mm -hmm. least. Uh, of course, some people can't afford it. Uh -huh. And of course, out of these three people, uh, one might be a child, mm -hmm. which won't drive. So, and and obviously, some people have more than one car. Mm -hmm. So, I'd go with two cars per household. So, one for each adult on average. Obviously, okay. some people don't own cars, but then some people have more than one. Does that sound okay? Yeah, sounds pretty good. Okay, so I have all the assumptions that I need. Actually, number of times replaced per year. You gave me in miles, I need to transform that into a per year basis. Right. Before I do my math. And I may need a little bit more structure and a little bit of math here. So we don't have we don't happen to have how many miles an average American car runs per year, right? No. Okay. Interesting. So let me see how I estimate that. So the average adult has their own car. They usually drive alone uh, in America. So most cars are being used every day, right? Out of these two cars. Uh, but then you have, let's call it, I'd say heavy users and light users, but I'll call them commuters. Uh-huh. Uh, and let's say known commuters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because commuters, they drive from suburbs to cities or from one town to another to yeah. work. And my guess is that they spend about two hours per day on the car. Okay. Uh, so one to go to work and one to go come back at, let's say, 50 miles per hour because they're usually on the highway. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then known commuters. My guess is they'd spend like 30 minutes per day. Okay. Okay, on the car at uh, is a lower speed because they're usually in their city or town, so at 30, mi 30 miles per hour. Okay. Does Do these uh, assumptions sound reasonable? Yeah, sounds okay. reasonable. And I'd need a split between commuters and non-commuters. So let's say 50% each. Okay. Okay, can I go with that? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so check this out. Like I told you before, at some point, Bruno has to start placing numbers in the ends of his tree. So that's what I call the assumptions that he will use in his model. And right now, that's what he's doing. And basically, he can sort of guess at this point because his mistakes in some assumptions will somewhat cancel out the mistakes in another. So if some number he guesses too high, you know other he'll guess too low, and maybe he might be close to right in the final number. But he can't really guess at like completely. Because in this moment in the interview, the interviewer wants to see if he can put logic and numbers behind his assumptions. So basically the interviewer wants to see that the, he understands what factors are affecting each number and how. And so He's going to have to do some math modeling in some of them. In some, he can just list the factors and then come up with a number. But basically, uh, right now, he's got to guess them. And the interviewer wants to see, as a principle, if he can come up with a logic for each one of them. All right, so let's do some math here. And I'll start with the number of times replaced per year because this is the most more tricky math. Okay. Okay, so uh, I need to find... How many miles for commuters and non-commuters? For commuters, they drive two hours a day at 50 miles per hour. So that's 100 miles per day, 
right? Mm -hmm. And non-commuters drive half an hour at 30 miles per hour, so that's 15 miles per day, right? Yeah. Uh, so on average, because it's 50-50, that would be 115 divided by 2 to find the how much the average American car runs. Yeah. Uh, can I do 120 divided by 2 so I can have 60 miles on average? Sure. Okay. I, I thought you were going to be mean to me. I thought about it, but <laughs> yeah, let's move on. Now, this is something that I absolutely love. So many people trap themselves into tough math because they forget that what they're doing is essentially an estimation. Many people call them guesstimates, for, hell, for God's sake. So they have no idea if many of the numbers that they're putting in there are right. Yet they're dividing numbers like 398 by 21, like this one is going to make a huge difference. They could just divide 400 by 20 and get to 20 in a split second, and it wouldn't even make a difference in the answer. Anyway, my point is you can round numbers. Uh, the interviewer needs to be on board, so make sure that you ask them if they're okay with that rounding. And of course, make sure you're not rounding a lot more than 10%. Like if you're rounding 12 to 10, then that's a bit of a stretch. But rounding small numbers to make your math easier is something that's encouraged. Okay? Now let's go on. Okay, so let's say the average American car uh, runs at 60 miles per day, which equals per year... Uh, that's 60 times, I'll do 360 days per year because mm -hmm. they might not run every day. Yeah. Maybe people travel, right? So let's do this math. 360 uh, times 60. Let me find a shortcut here, Julio. Mm -hmm. uh, so 300... 36 times 10 equals 360, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I have this extra zero here. And I have to multiply this by 6 because I did by 10 instead of 6. Mm -hmm. uh, still a little cumbersome, right? Uh, but... Let me multiply this by 2 and then by 3. Okay, so this is 7,200 times 3. That's 21,600, 21.6 thousand miles uh, per year. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it's between... 30 and 70,000 miles that they have to change, right? Yeah. So if I do two years of the average car, that would be 42,000 miles. Can I assume this is an average? I know the exact medium point between 30 and 70K would be 50, mm -hmm. but maybe people uh, maybe people change their brake pads a little earlier than that. Okay. Or All maybe right. maybe it's a little later. I, I mean... No, it's okay. You can assume that they're poor drivers and don't need to change their brake pads more. Oh, so this is the variability. Is This is not an average, the 30 to 70. It depends on how well they drive. Yeah, well, you've got to change your brake pads in that space. But mm -hmm. if you drive poorly, your brake pads are going to be... Uh, they're going to wear out before. Okay. If the roads are in bad conditions, they might wear out before. Okay, interesting. So on the lower end, not before the 30,000 miles. Okay, but most highways are in good conditions in, in the U.S. Yeah, but you can assume that people are poor drivers. I'll let you use that number. Okay. All right, now it's time for calculations. You're seeing Bruno calculating. You're going to see him calculating more. Now, many people think that when you're doing calculations in case interviews, interviewers want to see if, you're being, if you can be a math genius and if, if you can divide... Uh, by 7.33 in your mind in a split second, I cannot emphasize this enough, that is not the case, right? They really just want to see if you're number fluent and that you can catch your own mistakes. So if you make a mistake, they want to see that you're the one who's going to say, oh, no, 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 this is wrong. This is not 10 million, it's 10 billion or whatever. Because when you're doing the actual consulting job, Excel is going to do most of the math, let's be honest. But you do need to be able to see, for example, if there is a math mistake 
uh, or something doesn't add up in your slides. And you're going to be able to do, you need to be able to do simple math in your mind, right? Because you're going to be talking to clients and clients are going to tell you some numbers and you've got to do that quickly in your mind. It doesn't have to be super quick, but it does have to be fluent. All right? Okay, I'll go with this one. But I need to check in real life because maybe people procrastinate and they right. might change every three years. Right. So let's go with 0 0.5 uh, replacements per year, mm -hmm. per car. Okay. Right? Uh, and then you have two axles per car, so it's one axle replaced per car, which is a neat number, mm -hmm. right? So let's find the number of cars. You have 300 million people, Three people per household, that's 100 million households. Mm -hmm. Two active cars per household, that's 200 million cars in the U.S. Yeah. Sounds about right, uh, considering the population is 300 million. So you have to sell 200 million uh, kits of, of brake pads, considering a kit is an, a whole axle. Yeah, of brake pads per year, and at eighty dollars per axle, mm, the way I do this math, well, it's kind of simple, right? It's two times eight is sixteen, and then I add three zeros. Uh, sixteen thousand million dollars, which is equal to sixteen billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Uh. Now, does this number make sense? I mean, I'm quite confident in the assumptions because uh, besides the ones you gave me, they're pretty, I mean, I, I didn't make a big mistake by by a large margin. Yeah. But let me see if I can find a way to triangulate this number, mm -hmm. okay? So one way to see it is that each household will spend... They have two active cars, so one car per household will get a break, like a brake pad replacement per year. Mm -hmm. So each household spends eighty dollars per year in brake pads, yeah. which is like uh, six dollars per month mm -hmm. on average, which kind of makes sense because it doesn't seem like a big item spend. Yeah. Uh, it's less than you would expect to spend in car maintenance. Yeah, for sure. But there's all other elements of car exactly, maintenance. Yeah. But what I mean is you don't give much thought of your expenditure for brake pads, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so $80 per year makes sense. Also, if you think like how much would you spend on maintenance per year for a car? Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, we're spending $40 per car. Yeah. Because, you know, this $80 is, is for two cars. So $40 per car per year on brake pads, which is maybe like 10% of a car's maintenance spending. Mm -hmm. If this is true, this would imply a $400 per car maintenance budget per year, which sounds about right. Uh, yeah. Makes sense because you have tires, you have uh, oil changes and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So this sounds reasonable. Uh, I wouldn't say this is a large number at all, mm -hmm. although it sounds big, like 16 billion. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds reasonable given that it's a small spending per year per household. Yeah, sounds reasonable to me. All right, this part is just gold. So what Bruno did here is something that most people don't even know that you need to do in estimations and market sizing cases, but you absolutely need to do them. It's called a reality check. And it basically means checking in with reality to see if your number makes any sense at all. All right, so basically, it usually it takes finding something in reality that you can compare with your number. So in this case, it could be something like the total car maintenance market or the total car market or something like this. Now, Bruno could not use these numbers because he simply didn't know them, but he did manage to find a way to check if his conclusions made sense with reality somehow. Now, this is something that consultants do all the time because they always need to be checking if their models make sense or if the numbers they get from their clients make sense or if they need to get, dig deeper to understand those numbers. 
or maybe they need to question if that number is really right. And of course, managers need to reality check their consultants and their analysts' models all the time. And the reason they're checking all of those models and all of those numbers is because they absolutely cannot afford to use numbers that they get from clients that are inaccurate. And also, they can't afford to show numbers as a result of models that don't make sense. So consulting firms also can't afford to audit every single model or get two or three consultants doing the same model all the time because these people are really expensive. Heck, they're expensive and that's part of the reason you want to join McKinsey yourself, probably. So what they do is hire people who can reality check by themselves. The way they do that is test in the interview if those people can reality check. And that is exactly why you need to do reality checks in your interviews. Now, if you want to learn more about how to do reality checks, some techniques to do them, and even get some practice, that's one of the things that you're going to learn in our free market sizing estimations and case interview fundamentals course, which you can find at craftingcases.com slash free course. Now, let me ask you a quick question. Okay. If people were to replace their brake pads once every three years instead of once every two years, how would that number change? So here's something that catches many candidates by surprise. When interviewers ask them follow-up questions like I did now, asking Bruno how his final number would change if a specific number changed. Now, one thing that you should notice, I didn't pick any number for this. I picked the number that I thought was the most confusing. Like if I had picked the population of the US, it would be a lot more obvious how the final number would change. Population is smaller, then the market is smaller. It's obvious. Now, this isn't a hard one as well, not at, at least not very hard, but it's the most confusing one in there that I could find. Now, the thing is, interviewers sometimes want to see how well you understand your model. And so they ask you these types of questions especially when the math gets complicated within the structure, to see if you really understand the model. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to see how well Bruno understands what happens to his number if some of those numbers change. Now, this is especially common among partners at McKinsey, BCG, and Bain, but it's something that you're going to find yourself out of pretty easily if you've practiced enough market sizings before. Even better if you can practice with partners that ask follow-up questions or with content that has them. Now, I'm not going to bore you again telling you to join our free course, but our free course does have some of these. All right? Okay, that's that's a good good question. So uh, let me do this math right. Go on. Okay? So if they were replaced every year, mm -hmm. this number would be twice as big. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. times two equals 32 billion. Yeah. And then if we divided this by three, if they were replaced every three years, then uh, then this would be a, a just about 11 billion. Mm -hmm. So it, if you want more precision, this would be 10.66 billion dollars. All right, that makes sense. So the last thing that I want you to understand here, how realistic really is this case? So I'd say this is a market sizing on the easy side of the spectrum. But if you're lucky, you can find one like these in a first round in Bain or BCG. Now, if you want to learn how to solve any market sizing like a pro, you want to stand out in your interviews if you get one of them, if you want to be that person hoping to get a very tough estimation, because then that's when you know you're going to set yourself apart, check out our free market sizing and estimations course today. I've said this a thousand times in this video, and I'm going to say it once again, because it's the best free content on estimations out there. And you can find it in our website right now at craftingcases.com slash free course. The first module of the course is all about market sizings and estimations. And I guarantee you will love it because many, many candidates have told me in the past that it was the main reason they got their dream consulting offer. So I hope to see you in there and I hope you enjoyed this video. 